Well, good morning to you, and glad you've chosen to be here at Fellowship Community Church. Uh, Pastor Ethan at our North Campus and Pastor John Sharp at our uh, Southwest Campus are giving their messages at their campuses, and so it's just us guys today, and uh, delighted that you've chosen to be here. I know Kevin and uh, Wes have already greeted you, and we welcome you into this place. And today is not only Sunday, it is what? St. Patrick's Day. Why don't you take, now there's been tons of flu and respiratory stuff and colds and things going around. So I'm not going to ask you to shake any hands and give any hugs and certainly not greet one another with a holy kiss like it talks about in the scriptures. I'm just going to ask you to do this. Why don't you just stand up, find somebody close to you, give them a fist bump, say, glad to have you here today. All right, go ahead and have a seat. Uh, I love being a part of working with these guys, with Wes and Kevin and all the rest of our pastors and John and Ethan at our campuses. And um, from time to time, I get to be a part of different ministries. And uh, last Sunday evening, Dan Gifford had invited me uh, to be a part of Dodgeball with our student ministry. And uh, I thought, all right, I'll go out there and hit some kids with a ball. And... Uh, what I did not realize is that Dan Gifford had billed the entire evening uh, playing dodgeball. He billed it as this, come and hit a pastor in the face with a dodgeball. I'm like, thanks. And uh, so I get out here. We had epic. It was a wonderful time uh, together. And, and then we get in here in the gym and we're playing dodgeball. And uh, I did get beamed multiple times with the dodgeball and Toby Giuliano uh, one of our students was really, really good with dodgeball, and I didn't realize that I was his primary target. And I, after we got finished, I, I was a part of a team that won one game, and then I thought, I think we lost three or four games. And uh, I overheard Toby Giuliano and one of our other students, and the student asked him, said, uh, did you hit Pastor Ken? And he did this. I couldn't believe it. He hit his head, chest two times. I, d I did tell him this morning when I saw him, I said, uh, you know, I have to be honest. I said, you hit me pretty hard right in the chest. I said, I got up the next morning, lifted up my T-shirt just to see did I have a big old bruise of a dodge. I, I didn't, so I was glad to know I could still take it, you know. And uh, I'm, I'm coming after him next year, but glad to, glad to have you guys here. I want you to take your um, program notes in hand, uh, utilize something pins are there in the seat back. I want you to follow along. Last weekend, we looked at Psalm 2. Uh, by the way, do not miss out on being a part of a life group. If you miss being a part of a life group, you only get 50% of what we're going to get out of the book of Psalms, and I'd love for you to get every bit of it, so you can go right over here to life group's table after the service and uh, get connected to a life group. Um, I want us, we have a verse that's sort of the key that gives us sort of a focus throughout this entire series, and I want us to put it up on the screen, and I want us to read this passage of Scripture together. It's um, Psalm 73, 25, and I want you to read it out loud with me, real loud, real clear, so let's read it together. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Uh, in other words, God is our only hope, God is our only source of satisfaction, God is this, uh, joy, God is everything that we need to experience in life. Now, as you turn there to uh, Psalm 15 and you've got your notes uh, there in hand, let me just give you a recap of a couple of things that I thought Kevin did a great job of introducing this series, and I just want to go over it again because you might be a first-time guest. There are 150 Psalms, and the Psalms are identified in this way, when they would hear a particular line, they would recall the entire psalm. Uh, let me give you an example that would parallel today. If, if I said, uh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, you would be able to say, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but was blind, but good, good. And so when they would hear something like uh, the beginning of the 23rd psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, they would know, I shall not want. Yeah, you got it. So that's the whole understanding. It is this uh, Jewish hymn book that we find. It's very 
artsy, a lot of uh, figurative language that we find in the Psalms, but it does help us understand some tremendous, tremendous truths. Now, I want to, uh, Warren Wiersbe, uh, Bible commentator, helped a lot with my understanding of the content of Psalm 15, and uh, we tweaked it a little bit, but he pretty much gave us the outline uh, for what we're going to look at uh, in this today, and so I want to give credit where credit is due. Now, you see in your copy of the scriptures that David is the one that wrote this particular psalm. Uh, some people think that he wrote this psalm right after he has brought the, the Ark of the Covenant into the tabernacle in the city of Jerusalem. And so uh, he is rejoicing, he is celebrating, he's thinking about what it means to have the Ark of the Covenant and to go there uh, to the tabernacle. One other interesting note about this. Um, many of the commentators that I read said this, that Psalm 15 could be considered and possibly was for Jesus a loose-knit framework for what he gave in the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, at first I thought, nah, that's just one of the, sort of those pastoral things. You know, they're reading more into it. The more I studied the passage of Scripture, the more it grew on me. In fact, I'm going to allude to several times, not only what we see in Psalm 15, but what we see in the Sermon on the Mount. That's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So let me read to you the text, and then we're going to jump in and go back and uh, look at it in some detail. Verse 1 of Psalm 15, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? In other words, who's going to be there? Who has the ability? When you sojourn with somebody, you travel, you're, you're being together. Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Now, here's the framework, and here's where um, Warren Wiersbe and other commentators were helpful. It starts with a question, then it gives the answer, and at the end we find a promise. So real simple. Question, answer, promise. Let's say those three things out loud together. Question, answer, and promise. So with that in mind, let's look at it uh, in some detail. First insight is this out of the passage, is seeking God's presence. Th this is a passage about who has the ability to sense and be aware of God in his life. Um, in Matthew chapter 6, do you, do you remember real early on there in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was asked by his disciples, hey, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus would say these words. Here's the, here's the model. Here's the template for it. Our Father, which art in heaven. No Jew would have ever said that like addressing God. There, there was fear and trepidation, and Jesus was changing this whole dynamic so that they could understand that God loved them, and God sought them, and God had a desire to be in relationship with them. That's why they were to call and address Him as Father. Last week, um, Kevin, as he dealt with Psalm chapter 2, he he used a phrase that, as I was hosting out at our Southwest campus, it really stood out in my mind. There's this whole thing about God and our understanding of relationship with Him. It's not about God's ultimatum. It's about God's invitation. Some of us view Christianity as this long list of do's and don'ts, and, and we lose out the fact that, that God knows that we need a relationship with Him, and it's about experiencing His presence in our life. It dawned on me as I was studying this text this past week. Like, everything in the Bible is about our relationship to God. From the very beginning, Adam, he, he's, he and Eve are there in the Garden of Eden. And even when he sins, God says to them, Adam, where are you? God is that relentless God that he is pursuing Adam and Eve. And then I, I think about uh, Moses on Mount Sinai and God reveals his glory to him. I think about how Noah was in relationship with God. I think about Enoch in the scriptures. He walked with God and God took him. I think about Paul in the New Testament that I might know him. Every, every single thing that we see in the scriptures is about this understanding of being in relationship with God, sensing his presence. 
I want to go back to uh, the scripture, verse 1. It says this, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? Let me, let me introduce the thought this way. Have you ever been to, like, what's the biggest house that you've ever been to? I know one of the biggest that I've ever been to is down to the Biltmore house built by the Vanderbilts and over 100,000 square feet of living space. And when you walk up to the Biltmore house, you're looking at it in the distance and you're like, oh my. Like, like I did the calculations, 70 of my houses would fit inside the Biltmore mansion. 70 of them. It's crazy. And as we think about this, can you imagine, because... Those that would journey there to the city of Jerusalem, they would come up roughly three times a year. And the one that we think of most often was there during the week of the Passover. And, and when they would come, can you imagine that they're walking up to the city of Jerusalem? They're seeing the city walls around Jerusalem in the distance. They're getting close to the tabernacle and they're viewing it in all of its ornate glory. And they're thinking about where do I stand in relationship to God? I'm coming to bring sacrifice. I'm coming to worship the Lord. I'm coming to experience His presence. I love it. This, uh, this who shall dwell in your tent. It, it's that word that we get uh, translated. The Shekinah glory of God. They wanted to sense. See, there's nothing more dry. There's nothing more rigid than you're coming to church and your heart is a million miles away from God. And I've been there. And you come into this place and you're trying, and just as they would come three times a week, could those in, in Jesus' day, could those in Old Testament times, could they worship the Lord anywhere? Yes. But there was something special about those three occasions that they would come, and as they came, and as they walked up that hill to the city of Jerusalem, they would determine, I, I want to sense, I want to be a, aware of God's glory at work in my life. A.W. Tozer that man of God and commentator and pastor says this, Nothing in or of this world measures up to the simple pleasure of experiencing the presence of God. All struck by His presence. There is pleasure in His presence. That you and I just, it, it, there will nothing will bring you satisfaction and joy and abundance, and nothing will satisfy the deepest longings of your soul apart from experiencing the reality of God in your life. Now, that's the question. Now, what's the answer to the question? And that's the second point is this, is obeying God's commandments. Obeying God's commandments. Uh, it, it even dawned on me as I thought about this, uh, Pastor Ethan, one of the things that I love about collaboration with other pastors that as we read commentaries that we discuss and we were talking on the phone on Monday morning and Easton, Ethan brought this out he said uh, if you think about it even the commandments because we're getting ready to delve into some do's and some don'ts and things we're supposed to do and things we're supposed to avoid and, and Ethan made the comment and the observation he said uh, even those things are all about relationship uh, you think back to the Ten Commandments what were the Ten Commandments First four of the Ten Commandments were all about relationship to God, that vertical relationship. The second of the six uh, Ten Commandments are all about that horizontal relationship that we have with each other. Uh, everything that we see in the Bible, in the Ten Commandments, everything that we're to do is all about the nature of relationships that we have. Now, for simplicity and time's sake, I just divided it up into three categories uh, of things that we need to either do or not do based on this passage of Scripture. First of all, there is this blameless character. Blameless character. Image is what you show to others. Character is what you are deep down. I image is the car that you drive, the home that you live in, the clothes that you wear, how you handle yourself. That, that's your image. The, the character is who you are deep down. The, the character is this. It, it's what you are that nobody else knows about. Verse 2. He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. Walking blamelessly. 
that, that we have this heart that just is inclined that I, I want to do whatever it is that God desires for me to do in terms of how my, I live my life. So a part of this is having blameless character. Secondly, it's this. It's truthful conversation. Truthful conversations. Back um, a few years ago, we went down to Greenville, South Carolina to visit our daughter and son-in-law and granddaughter Ellie. And we went out to this apple orchard. And it had, a, uh, it had a place down through the middle of the apple orchard that was probably about twice the width of this center aisle here. And I guess it was big enough for the trucks and the apple pickers to go through there. But it was one of these orchards where it was pick your own apples. And the thing was, we had gotten there late on a Saturday and we started looking at the trees as we went down uh, either up. And I'm like, there aren't any apples that are on these trees. We had to go back a few rows to find some apples. And when we found those apples, they were delicious. It, it's interesting in this passage of Scripture that there is the, this word reproach or slur or slander. This talks about this. In the Hebrew language, it's talking about the stripping of the trees of the fruit just as we would strip a person of their reputation. Um, that's a real danger these days. Do you find that one of the most difficult things is to keep your mouth closed? I, I do. Um, truthful conversations doesn't mean this. Sometimes we'll say, well, I, I know it's true, so I'll just go ahead and say it. There are many things that we know about other people that we'd just be better off not to say, even if they're something that is accurate in terms of what we've been told. Do we build each other up or do we tear each other down by the words that we give? The book of James tells us no man is able to tame the tongue. It does require. I, one of the things that I've appreciated, this is one of the ways that God's worked in my life, is there have been multiple times over the last months that I'll get ready to say something, and it is accurate and it is true, but it is unnecessary. And the Holy Spirit has just put a, a shut on my mouth. And I haven't always been successful. In fact, there have been times where I've had to go back to some. You know, I shouldn't have said that. So the blameless character, truthful conversation. Do, do you remember um, what your mama or your grandma used to say to you about saying bad things about others? If you can't say something good, don't say what? Yeah, don't say anything at all. Don't say anything. Depends on how your grandma or your mama phrased it. And then there's this third thing, righteous conduct. Righteous conduct. That the way that we would live, the way that we would interact with people would exhibit righteous living. In a number of different ways. And these are just some summaries of the ways that we flesh this out. Verse 4 and verse 5. It says, In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. In other words, we're to hate the evil. We're to hate social injustice that we see in our culture. And, and it says also on the flip side, but who honors those? When, when's the last time that you've sent a word of encouragement to a brother or sister in Christ or sent a text to somebody or instant message someone and said, thank you for what you do. Thank you to your life group leader. Thank you to a ministry leader. Thank you to just, thank you for being a blessing in my life. Maybe to even send a, a note of encouragement to your spouse. Thank you. I see Jesus in your life and how he's working in your life. All, all these ways. But honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change. Some translations put it this way. A person, this is basically referencing this, who keeps his promise. You, many of you have kids and many of you have grandkids. You, you know what I learned over the years? Uh, because it was terrible. Your, your kids will be, if you make a promise to kids, they will relentlessly remind you about that promise that you made. I see a lot of heads going, yeah, like, yeah. You know what I learned to do over the years? Just don't make a lot of promises. <laughs> you know, just do what you're going to plan on doing, but don't, don't, don't make promises if you're going to change your mind or not be able to fulfill or keep those promises. And then it continues on. And who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. You've seen over the last few days the whole thing with this college admission scam and, and uh, Lori Laughlin and all this going on. Who knows how all that will pan out. But it looks like people have used their money in abusive ways. I'm reminded when I read down through verses 2 through the first part of verse 5 of what Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount. 
I had never picked on, uh, up on this until a few years ago. We were looking at specifically the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus would say these radical things. Jesus would say things like, um, hey, you, you, you've you heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I tell you, turn the other cheek. Go the second mile. Love your enemies. And people were like, well, how in the world are we going to do that? And Jesus would say things like, uh, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I want to tell you, the standard is this. You can't even lust. And people are like, well, that's nearly impossible. And then there were things like, you've heard it said, don't commit murder. And Jesus alludes to that in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you can't even get angry. You can't hate. You can't be bitter and resentful toward others. And by the time that Jesus goes through the Sermon on the Mount, they're like, whoa. Who can be saved? Like, this seems impossible. And that's exactly the point. The the point of what David is saying here is, without a spiritual transformation, without Jesus, without us understanding that we can't do it on our own, we never have the ability to be obedient to Christ. The, The standard is so high, that's why we need Jesus. Now, I want you to keep your finger here at Psalm 15, and I want you to turn to the New Testament. We're just going to look at one passage of Scripture. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And most of us are pretty familiar with like a verse like Romans 3.23. That is a passage of Scripture that many of you could... Repeat, and you know it by memory. It's a very, very familiar passage of Scripture. In fact, let's just give it a go while everybody else is turning to Romans uh, chapter 3. Let's just say Romans 3.23 out loud together. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Let's say it again. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's in the context of something that I had never picked up on. Verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. In other words, it's been revealed apart from the law, referencing Jesus. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, we all fall short of the the requirements in Psalm 15. We fall short just in terms of other commands that we see and are justified by His grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood. Now, propitiation means this. God is appeased. God is satisfied by the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary's cross. To be received by faith. It's grace and faith in combination. All that we can do is believe. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance, He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time So that he, now pick up on this phrase, I love verse 21. That he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. When you believe, when you trust in God for salvation, God doesn't overlook your sin. He holds you accountable for your sins. He is a just God. But simultaneously with being a just God... He is the justifier through what Christ did for us on the cross. In other words, he took all of our sins and put them on Jesus. And therefore, what Jesus did on the cross covers us. That's why it talks about that the blood of Jesus Christ has covered and cleansed us from our sin. It's amazing. It's, we ought to be awestruck by the amazing wonder that he simultaneously is the just and he is the justifier in our lives. I, I used to think when I was growing up as a kid going to church, well, that because of sort of the distinction between Old and New Testament, the people in the Old Testament were saved by their works and people in the New Testament were saved by grace. That's not the case. People in the Old Testament were saved the same way we are saved, through Jesus Christ. All it was, the distinction is this. In the Old Testament, Jesus was to come. They were still looking to the Messiah. They were still looking to Jesus. They looked in anticipation, whereas we look backwards to what Christ did 2,000 years ago. Saved the same way. Had to believe, had to trust in Christ for salvation, had to anticipate that the Messiah was to come. They couldn't save themselves, not by their works. 
So the standard that we see in the scripture is to help us recognize our great need of Jesus. Warren Wiersbe says in relationship to this text, it is important to note that Psalm 15 is not a prescription for being saved, but a description of how saved people ought to live if they want to please God and fellowship with Him. Not, not saved by our works, saved to good works that we do because He's changed our hearts. He's changed the way that we think about life. We've trusted in His gift of salvation. Now let me, let me give you one little caveat. Go back to verse 12, 2. Verse 2 uses the word blameless, that we have to be blameless. One of the things that I discovered about the word blameless is this. Blameless does not mean sinless. He knows we're going to blow it. What blameless means is this, is that when you get convicted of sin in your life, when God, through the power of His Holy Spirit, sort of busts you, when God gives a revelation of who He is, you confess it to Him, and if need be, you say, Hey, please forgive me. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. That's what it means to be a blameless person. But it's the kind of person to be blameless means this. That every relationship, every attitude, every habit that you have and possess in your life, everything about every realm of your life means this. You come on a daily basis saying, Yes, Lord. I trust you in this area of my life. That, that's what it means to be a blameless person. Seeking God's presence, obeying God's commandments, and then third, trusting God's promise. Trusting God's promise. It's, uh, the reason it grew on me is because one Bible commentator talked about how there are two ways to build your life. You can uh, Jesus at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he says... Uh, Hey, let me tell you the story. He's been given all this teaching, and he closes out the Sermon on the Mount with this. He says, uh, hey, there were two guys. One guy, he built his house on the sand. And then there's another guy that he built his house on the rock. And when the winds came and the storm came through and everything, the guy that built his house on the sand, what happened to him? Uh, the house was demolished. But the guy that built his house, it's, some, it's, it's the picture of this. If you build your life on the things that Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount, you're going to be on that strong foundation. You're going to be secure. Things aren't going to get your goat. You're going to view life differently, even when life is chaotic. I love the uh, end part. We've gone from question to the answer to the promise here of trusting God's promise. And it's verse 5, and let's put this up on the screen uh, let's read this out loud together. Read along with me. He who does these things shall never be moved. The last three words, let's say them again. Never be moved. If you're in a relationship to God, you will never, never be moved. Why? That, that doesn't mean that, that you'll just avoid storms, that you won't have any calamities, you won't have any difficulties. What it means is this. I was watching this uh, video. You know, it, sometimes when you go to YouTube, it'll say, hey, and I do this little news app, and it, and it said, here's the most viewed videos, and it was this ocean liner. It was a cruise ship, and winds came, 100 mile an hour plus winds, and it was showing the in, uh, inside the cruise ship, and it, the, it, was, it didn't capsize, but it was turning to the side. And all the dishes and glassware and people were going all crazy inside this, this restaurant on this cruise liner. And they were shifting in one direction. They were being moved. Scripture tells us this. That when you know and you're in relationship with God, when you're experiencing His presence, you have the ability that no matter what happens in your life, you won't be moved. You won't be shaken. People won't get your goat. I, I started thinking about it. I was driving on the way to church this morning. I, I thought sometimes, you know, you feel like in your life the boss is ready to fire you, your spouse hates you, your kids are cussing you, and the dog bit you. You know, you get to this point in life that you're thinking, can anything else go wrong in my life? And maybe, maybe you're looking back at this past week and you're wondering that in your mind. And I'm telling you that when you experience the the true bona fide presence of God in your life, and when He's real to you, and you acknowledge that that's the simple pleasure, that there's nothing other than living in right, right relationship with God that's going to bring you satisfaction, it, it makes all the difference in the world. Warren Wiersbe. This means that the godly described in this psalm 
have security and stability in life and don't have to be afraid of earthquakes or eviction notices. All struck by the fact that he says this, you will never be moved. Back a few weeks ago when we were doing the prayer series, I had, uh, I had read a, a Facebook post that Nancy Simmons um, had posted. Uh, Kathy Simmons at our Southwest campus, she had lost her, her dad. And, and uh, it was, there was this ICU waiting room and, and here was Brooke was praying with one person and Nancy was praying with somebody and, and uh, Kathy was praying with another person. They had all these amazing things. And here you think that the time where they're dealing with Sarah and their own difficulty and Kathy's getting ready to lose her dad. But she realized that God put them there in that ICU waiting room for a purpose and a plan that was grander than just the sorrow and the grief that they were about to experience. Last Sunday afternoon, I got a text and Brooke had obviously missed that message and she had gone back and she listened to the message and she sent me this text and it was pretty amazing because she said, I want to share a few things with you. And she calls her grandfather Gun Gun. Oh, I would love to hear the story behind that. But she said, losing my Gun Gun will go down as one of the hardest times in my life, but that day will also go down as one of the best. I've never experienced such a day because of his faith in Christ. He knew what was ahead and his body was tired. And we talked about the future and had the absolute sweetest time with him on his last day on earth. Also, I believe our time in the hospital was so intentional. And from the Lord, there were so many situations and so many people put in our path that needed us and the Lord. It was crazy. It's like Nancy, Mom, and I didn't even need to speak to each other to know exactly what to do. But we knew these people needed help, and we were put in each other's paths, and we just did it together. It was such a hard time, but one I am so thankful for. That's that's the, the real difference of being able to experience the presence of God. And I, I ask you this, that... When the storms come and when the challenges and the difficulties in your marriage with your kids, with the boss at work, are you looking at life through that lens? Are you able to experience it in that way? We started with talking about those that would journey to the city of Jerusalem. And I I think about specifically that as they came up, to the tabernacle, that they were thinking about their sin, their need for forgiveness, the sacrifice that they had brought and would present to the priest. And I think also about the city of Jerusalem and that it was there. That Jesus walked that hill of Calvary. And even though we don't have the ability to be blameless, Jesus bore all of our sins on Calvary's cross so that you and I have the ability to experience the presence of God. Do you just know about the Bible? Do you just know the story of Jesus' death and resurrection or do you truly know Him? I believe God has some people in this service today you don't know Christ, you've never received forgiveness of your sin, I'm telling you, if you'll just apply what we've talked about today to say, that's what I want. I want to surrender my life. I want to be changed and transformed. That, that sin and that weight of guilt can just be put behind you and you can begin a whole new chapter of life. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. I want to lead in a word of prayer. It could be that you would open up your heart, your life to Jesus today to say, I want to experience your presence. And you pray a prayer along these lines. It's not the words of this prayer. It's the attitude of a person's heart. But you pray something along these lines. Lord, I surrender my life to you. And I want to experience your change and transformation because... I can't do life on my own. My goodness will never be good enough to match your holy standard. So thank you for what you did on the cross. And all I can do is trust you by faith. Believe in you. 
accept your gift of salvation by grace. I thank you for coming into my life. I thank you for the change that you will bring about by your power and strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.